welcome to Aqua 10. Next week is our last one. So we've been enjoying learning about the river of life and how the Holy Spirit is in fact God's river of life. And so this morning we are looking at serving in the power of the Spirit. Because as Christ pours out His Holy Spirit into our hearts and into the church, one of the things He gives us is gifts. We're coming up to Christmas and we're thinking of what gifts to give various members of the family. God is a God full of generosity and He loves to give gifts to His children. He gave Jesus, His only Son. Together they gave the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit continues to give gifts. And we're going to be looking at that. Because Jesus wants us to serve His people. And He calls us to serve one another. Galatians 5 says, serve one another in love. And it's the Holy Spirit who motivates us to do all sorts of acts of service. All of you have been involved in various acts of service this week. And if you think back, you'll find, well, it was a combination of fruit, kindness and goodness, and of mostly the gift of service. So we're all called, as we live in the river of life, to serve one another in love. Jesus set an example for this service, and He Himself came to serve. He said that the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. And so we remember how Jesus washed His disciples' feet. And He said, as I have washed your feet, so you must wash one another's feet. And washing one another's feet is about serving and ministering to one another according to our needs. Their need was obviously there in this, because of the smelly roads of Palestine to have their feet washed and there was no servant to do it. Jesus took the place of the servant and He calls us to follow His example in service. One of the last things Jesus said to His disciples is at the beginning of Acts when He said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come to us and live in us. He gives us the resources to do the witnessing and the serving. And the power of the Holy Spirit motivates and enables us to do acts of service, acts of kindness, acts of mercy, which make a big difference in people's lives. We can pray for that strengthening power. Paul prayed for the Ephesians. This is a beautiful prayer. And he prayed for them, and we can pray it for ourselves and for others as we pray for more power. He said, I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Somebody was sharing with me the difference between the apple tree and the Christmas tree. The apple tree has fruit that come from the inner flow of life. The Christmas tree is produced artificially, some are totally artificial, but the various things we hang on a Christmas tree, all those lights and baubles, they're inserted from outside for a little period of time and then removed. In the one case, the fruit tree is an example of the spirit working, it says, in your inner being. The life comes from within and then is expressed outwardly. And that's how the Spirit works in our lives, from within outward. Whereas religiosity, or just formal religion, you, you put on, let's say, the show 
or the, the uniform or whatever it is for the time at church and that's finished. Church is done, off we go, back to our lives. It's like the Christmas tree. Um, it's a sort of artificial outward display. The Holy Spirit saves us from the outward artificial display of religiosity, but works from within. It's a rather beautiful analogy. So let's think of some of the gifts that the Bible speaks about. First of all, in Romans 12, there's a list of gifts. You can check your sheet and we'll read out of the Bible. Um, the one side is Acts 16, which we'll look at just now. The other side has two sections, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. And in Romans 12, we have a list of the charismata or spiritual gifts. Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts, that's charismata in the Greek. According to the grace given us, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And so, the overflow of the Holy Spirit, the, the fruit and the gifts produced by the inner life of the Spirit, lead to various types of expressions, what we could call embedded motivational gifts. This is how you are motivated to be towards others. And so, We've got prophecy, and you, you can write those out if you'd like to on your booklet. There's prophecy, which is speaking God's message into a situation. Preaching is connected to that, but there's spontaneous prophecy where you want to speak a word to somebody from God. And uh, prophecy is, in that sense, it's not foretelling the future. That's only one form of prophecy. Prophecy is forth telling, speaking forth what God wants to speak to somebody and He uses us to speak. Prophecy, um, serving, that's, that's a pretty clear gift of, and it's, a, it's an important and common gift. Teaching, the explaining of God's truth, uh, the explaining aspect of giving insight and understanding, teaching, encouraging. What an important gift. When a person who's, got, who's an encourager comes into a friendship or a room, there's an upliftment. There's an increase, increase in spiritual energy, you might say. But you don't just have to be outgoing to be an encourager. You can give words, you can give gifts, you can give affirmations, you can give friendship with a gift of encouragement. And then contributing to the needs of others. You see what somebody needs and you just want to go and help them and give into their need. Leadership, an important gift. The, the, the people who steer the ship forward into the future. Leadership and then showing mercy or mercy. Those are some of the embedded motivational gifts that the Bible describes. There's another list also in the New Testament that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 12, which you might say are spontaneous spiritual gifts. And I'll read with you in 1 Corinthians 12 at <laughs> verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom to another the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit to another miraculous powers to another prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits 
or discernment to another speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit and He gives them to each one just as He determines. You think of children around the Christmas tree and the fathers distributing the gifts. He doesn't leave anybody out as a loving father. Each one gets their special gift. The same with our Heavenly Father. Through the Holy Spirit, He gives each one, it says, some combination of gifts to be useful for Him in His work. There's a, another one further down at the end of the chapter, which is administration. Teaching and administration are listed at the end of chapter 12. So if you put these gifts together with the other list, we have quite a series of gifts of the Spirit. I've tried to separate them into what you could call doing or serving gifts or speaking gifts. Uh, Peter in his epistle actually says using the gifts of speaking or serving and he just has two classifications of types of gifts in his epistle Paul goes as he is a, a more analytical teacher um, he goes into much more detail so I wonder which gifts you might have to serve the Lord maybe doing or serving such as serving Helps, mercy acts, miracles, healing prayer, administration. Where do you fit in? Where do you find God using you? And then speaking gifts, there's prophecy, teaching, languages and tongues, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, encouraging, leading. Some of them are overlap gifts. They, they will have doing and speaking. And in a sense, we all would have some sort of overlap. Wise people have said, if you want to discover your gift, then ask God to fill you with His love and get out with people. And as God's compassion arises in you, you will begin to do what sort of comes naturally and supernaturally. And you will find how you are useful for God. But it's worth praying, seeking how we might serve God. Because the gifts are given to build up the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14 says, Go for gifts that build up the church, like prophecy, speaking words and messages from God's word that build up others and strengthen them. That's why the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Strengthening, building others up. And that's why it's important for Christians to gather together in large groups and small groups. Because you will use your gifts to build others up as you learn to love and serve one another. Now I'd like to move this a little bit into a slightly different area. Remember the vision we had in Ezekiel 47? And as this river flowed, everything became green. But wherever the water went, the river went, the water changed. And the Dead Sea changed from being dead and non-life-giving to being life-giving. And around that Dead Sea, the amazing thing happened, which was already happening around the Sea of Galilee, further north, fish, swarms of fish arose. It says in Ezekiel 47, There will be large numbers of fish. The fish will be of many kinds. There will be places for spreading nets. And so, Ezekiel saw this picture of fishing, extensive fishing. Now we remember that Jesus said to his fishing disciples, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I remember in Cape Town we were at a beach last time we were there, a place called Hout Bay. 
And suddenly we saw these men walk in to the sea. It was very cold in that particular area. And they had nets. And they were throwing the nets out. And there were swarms of pulchards coming in. And it was a very exciting thing. The, uh, the seagulls and the cormorants were tr diving in. You could see the surface just frenzy with fish. Uh, do you remember Peter when Jesus called him at the end after Jesus had risen? Uh, Jesus said, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And they caught a mass of fish in the nets. John said 153. And uh, we believe that, that Jesus was actually allowing an enactment with fishing to happen as a symbol of the fishing that was going to come in evangelism and reaching out. And uh, so you might call 153 the number for evangelism, reaching the lost, reaching the unsaved with the message of Jesus. Um, the church needs to be involved in reaching out. And that first church, you remember in Acts 2, it said the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So church growth through evangelism is part of the river of life, the working of the Spirit, where new people come to Christ. And God's blessed us with that in the last year and two, with those who've been outside the church coming. The Alpha Course was a great uh, time of people coming to know Christ. But people come to know Christ in all sorts of ways. There are all sorts of different nets that can be used to catch fish. There are all sorts of different lures that can be used to catch fish. And we each need to think about the type of net or the type of lure that's going to work best for those in our family and our friendship circle to come to Christ. So let's look at a, what I call a case study in the Holy Spirit encountering people through Paul and Silas. And we can see here certain gifts of the Spirit and fruit of the Spirit being manifested to reach the lost. The case study is in Acts 16. In Acts 16 we have an account of Paul and Silas on Paul's second missionary journey. Now, the Spirit has moved the Gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and now we are, for them then, we are at the ends of the earth. And Paul and Silas are going out to their ends of the earth to take the Gospel. And they were wanting to go in a certain direction. What we're going to see is three situations with unconverted unsaved people. Lydia, a businesswoman, a slave girl possessed by demons, and the Philippian jailer. All in this chapter. It's an exciting chapter of how the church at Philippi was first formed by the spread of the gospel with Paul and Silas. But it was not an easy thing for Paul and Silas. So first of all, let us consider Luke's lessons with the lost in Philippi, Macedonia. This is where northern Greece is today. And uh, we see that to reach out, the Holy Spirit guides and places you in a situation where you can share the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit guided them through closed and open doors. Starting at verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. A door closed, some sensing that, no, that's not the right area. Let's wait, because we don't want to move ahead of the Holy Spirit. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, 
we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Closed door to Bithynia. Open door by the Spirit's guidance to Macedonia. And so the Holy Spirit gave them the indication by a type of a closed and then open door and then gave Paul a vision. We don't all need visions to go out and share the gospel, but this was a missionary journey, the second missionary journey, and they needed to know what region to go into. And so we need to be sensitive <coughs> to the Holy Spirit's guidance day by day, whether personally or as a congregation, as to how the Lord leads. The Spirit guides. But they also were very concerned about prayer. And we read in Ephesians 6, Paul writes, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. And so they had a prayerful attitude. You can pick this up in, in each of the three situations with those three people we're going to meet. Prayer is mentioned. Verse 13, On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. They wanted to first have some prayer down at the river before they began to share. And that's how meeting Lydia kicked off. And then verse 16, Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. And again, God's preparing them for the prayerful attitude for this encounter with the slave girl. And the same thing happens in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Prayerful atmosphere, prayerful attitude. And another encounter takes place. You know, as, as you go through your day, we're going to encounter people. You bump into people at the supermarket, at the dental office. And God is leading us in these encounters. And if we prepare our hearts prayerfully, He will use our words and our conversations and our friendship as we go along. So let's take a look at what happens. Well, they were led into what you could call spirit-led gospel conversations and witness. They, they, were, they had a heart and a desire to share Christ. So opportunities came. First of all with Lydia, verse 14, one of those listening, so there was a bit of a crowd down at the river, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. That means she was worshipping as in the Old Testament Jewish custom. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And so Lydia was ready to hear about Christ and accepted Christ. She became a newborn Christian. And they baptized her. And immediately she used the gift of hospitality with a fruit of kindness to have them home. By the way, as you read this section of Acts, it is Luke who's writing Acts, and he appears in places wherever the word we appears, it's Luke with Paul and Silas, or Luke with Paul. So we talk about the we passages in Acts, and this is one of them. And Luke was an observer and, and a, a partner in this gospel team. And so the Lord speaks to a businesswoman and a whole household comes into the river of life, new life in Christ. The jailer is a more interesting story in one sense. Um, 
verse 31 and 32, where when, well, we'll get into it a little bit later, but um, how did they get into jail, we'll look at. But they are willing to share the message in their conversation because when the jailer is about to kill himself, they get into the gospel and he says in verse 30, What must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. You see, Christian witness must lead, not necessarily in the first conversation you have with people, but over time, Christian witness leads to actually witnessing about Jesus. We, we don't witness as much about the church or the good preacher or even the aqua course. We, we need to talk about Jesus because you become a Christian by coming to Jesus. And so if we don't use the name of Jesus and talk about what Jesus has done for us, we're still not getting to the gospel. The good news is the good news of Jesus Christ who died and rose again to give us God's grace. And so they got to the point, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's about the shortest version of the gospel that you have, isn't it? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. It's going to affect your family and your family is going to start getting influenced for Christ as well. Now, there was quite a power, what you might call a power encounter with the slave girl. When they encountered dark forces, Paul warns us that our struggle is not just against human flesh and blood, but against spiritual dark forces in the heavenly realm. So, the devil wants to oppose the gospel, and the devil wants to interrupt uh, the progress of the good news of Jesus. So they have a strange experience here, which raises the issue of the occult and evil spirits. In uh, verse 16, Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. Now, the Bible teaches us in Deuteronomy 18 that there are certain spiritual uh, activities that God commands against and that are disobedience. And fortune-telling, uh, astrology, consulting the dead through medium, spiritualistic activity and such like are not God's will. The, we put it under the heading of the occult, which means the hidden things. And the, the issue is, you see, there are evil spirits who are deceiving. And if you get involved in contacting spirits, you're going to get deceived. And the imitation of a grandmother's voice or a grandfather's voice through the medium uh, doesn't mean that you're really connecting with, with your lost ones, lost uh, ancestors. It's going to be imitation. And you're going to get drawn away from the things of Christ into other things. Uh, you don't get true prophetic words from the occultic practices that are very common today. Even astrology often can lead to great fear because now you're told you might have this disease or this might be happening in the future. Your hopes are up or your hopes are dashed and you, you, it's just a confusion. Um, so she had been doing fortune telling and making profit out of the fortune telling. And then she started harassing them. This girl followed Paul, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. There was a sort of element of truth. She maybe thought she was being their public relations officer, and shouting ahead of them, you know, Yeah, they come, they're going to tell you how to be saved. But the way she did it wasn't of the Spirit. It wasn't of the goodness of Jesus. It was, maybe it was loud, maybe it was... Anyway, it became a disruption. She kept on and on doing it. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, 
the Spirit left. We have authority given to us by Jesus over evil forces and dark forces. And the name of Jesus has authority. The strong name of Jesus has full authority. Whether in prayer or whether in this case Paul actually commands the Spirit. There's not time to tell you of experiences that I've had or missionaries have, Christian workers, especially when you come into a new region. Missionaries going out into darkest Africa or darkest Canada or darkest wherever it is. When the gospel has got lost over a generation or two, or maybe never been there, the devil takes over and false practices like witchcraft begin to surface and some people actually get demonized and need the ministry of prayer and healing prayer or even uh, exorcism. This is a common uh, experience in the mission field especially. And so we, we, here we are warned that there are evil spirits but we are also encouraged to see the power of the name of Jesus. But this gets Paul and Silas into deep trouble and, and so they are accused. But just before we finish the story, the biblical view of the spiritual world is important these days. We have the Father, the Son and the Spirit. And the Son came to us in Jesus who then sent the Holy Spirit. And so, the Holy Spirit is the true Spirit of God. But, as God created the world, seen and unseen forces, there was a fall, and God created men and women in His image, but the, uh, Satan rebelled against God, and according to the Bible, a, a third of the angels fell with Satan. And those fallen angels are not God's angels. They are now evil spirits seeking to interrupt and deceive people and are working against God's message. And, and so this is the biblical view of the spiritual world. It's, it means that we need truth and knowledge of who Christ is and who the Holy Spirit is. We need the power of prayer in Jesus. And we need to know that there are certain activities that are off limits for Christians. However, there's forgiveness and especially we can help those who've got entrapped by some of the, the evil practices related to evil spirits and the fallen angels. So there, these two missionaries end up in jail because they were accused of throwing the city into an uproar and advocating customs unlawful for Romans. So they take them, they strip them, they put them in jail, they flog them, and they put them in the stocks. But here's this exuberant spirit of Christ working in them. And they're not bemoaning their fate. They see this as an opportunity. You know, if somebody goes to hospital, let's say, we, we probably are not going to get thrown in jail. But you know, some Christians spend three months or longer in the hospital. How do we view it? It's an opportunity. You're going to meet people you would never meet if you were not there. And so every difficult situation can become an opportunity for Christ's good news and for sharing His love. So there they are singing and the people are listening. And Paul and Silas, were they singing in harmony? Uh, what were they singing? Probably Old Testament hymns and some of the spiritual songs that were being taught in the churches. And they praised the Lord with some confidence and maybe some beautiful harmonies that intrigued the others. And so the others were getting prepared. Music prepares the heart for the presence of God and for the message of Christ. And of course we use that a lot in the church as we honor God with praise. And then there was, sorry, uh, then there was a, a miraculous interruption. And um, the, an earthquake hit this prison, and the prison doors flew open. God did a miracle, 
And the jailer saw this and thought he was going to lose his prisoners, in which case he would have been put to death by the authorities. So he thought, well, you know, I'm going to finish this off now. So he's going to commit suicide. And they interrupt him. And Paul and, Paul and Silas see him trying to commit suicide. And Paul shouts, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Well, he's already heard the songs. And he says, sir, what must I be? What must I do to be saved? God set this up for the sake of forming his church in Philippi. And this jailer and his family become Christians. And I'm sure he met the slave girl and Lydia in the little group of Christians that had been formed because of Christ's work. You know, the gospel brings opposition, even imprisonment. Paul, the one who was throwing Christians in jail before he came to Christ, now is thrown in jail for the message that he used to reject but now was proclaiming. I was reading about the sort of opposition that can happen to people who serve Christ in difficult places. Jackie Hamill was serving Christ, a young Australian prison evangelist, was excited about what God was doing. She had felt the love of Jesus reach out to the inmates. Jackie and 14 members of her church had traveled to the Philippines to minister in a military prison. They were concerned for the lost souls of the inmates, many of whom were communist guerrillas in prison for murder. Suddenly the quiet was broken by the sounds of fighting and gunshots. The inmates were rioting and had overpowered the guards, seizing their guns and ammunition to make an escape. The evangelists were taken hostage and held for three days. During this time, Jackie and one other girl were raped repeatedly. But even in the moments when she suffered the greatest shame, Jackie prayed for her captors and spoke to them about God's love. Her face did not show panic, revulsion or hatred, but clothed with the brightness of God's light. During her imprisonment, she led the team in singing God's praises and presented the gospel to her captors. One of the rioting inmates threw down his gun and received Jesus as his Savior. On the third day, there was a shootout between the prisoners and soldiers who came to stop the riot. Jackie and Juliet, a 16-year-old, were shot. Even as Jackie lay dying, she raised her hands to God, praying for the rioting inmates and for the soldiers. She died while singing to God. Tragic? Yes, humanly speaking, but victorious. For souls came into the kingdom through her ministry. And her life and her death honored the Lord in a powerful way. What courage she and her friend showed. But we need courage to go out. We need the strength of the Holy Spirit to go out for Christ in whatever way He leads us. And so, we find quite a lot of lessons from Luke about fishing for Jesus. Let's review. First of all, we should let the Spirit lead us to where doors are opened. Then we should have a prayerful attitude, praying for the strength and guidance of the Holy Spirit. We must be willing to take some risks with how we throw the net of the gospel out and where we might be led. There's always some risk. This person might reject me. I might offend them. Risking for the gospel. But ultimately we want to share Jesus saving grace with those who are desperately needing His love and His life. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you reach us through somebody coming with the message. Whether it was our parents or a Sunday school teacher or a friend. Whether it was through a message 
we, we needed those people to come and throw the gospel net out towards us. And we pray, Lord, that you will work in the churches here in Huntsville and across Canada so that we might be reaching out with the beautiful message of Christ's grace and how much He sets us free to be the people that you created us to be. We thank you for the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He has conquered sin and conquered death, and He has brought everlasting life for all who will reach out. Lord, we desperately need an outpouring of the Spirit, the river of life, so that there might be more fishing nets thrown out, and more of that 153 of your lost souls can be brought in. So we thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen.